Um, so I, have, I, should, I don't know if I should apologize at the start or at the end, but there is not actually a fractal in the talk. But the, 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 the mathematical things we've been working on in this broader notion of fractal-based analysis, um, the philosophical and mathematical content of things that are used in the fractal universe are motivators for doing things outside of that area. And so I thought it was, would be cute to share that um, with a, a group that's sort of thinking about fractal geometry a lot. So, uh, next, next. Okay, there we go. So, um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about a particular application problem in partial differential equations, an inverse problem. Um, the, I, had, I put some motivational sentences at the front. Um, PDEs are used to model all kinds of things. Um, my collaborator, who was on the first page, Davide Latore, who is now, uh, he, every talk I give, I have to change his is a busy issue because he moves, he's been moving around a lot over the years. Um, he's now at the Schema Business School in uh, the south of France and um, sort of has shifted towards operation research and economics and so on. So that's a direction that drives the, the mathematics we're thinking about in this paper. But we'll talk about a PDE's problem um, with a physical basis. The, um, the clicker doesn't seem to skip the last thing, at least for me. Okay, so the direct problem for a PDE is given a completely prescribed problem, find a solution. Um, and this sort of problem, in order to have a unique solution exist, you should have well-posedness of the problem. And uh, you know, the typical kind of things that we do in this realm is prove existence, uniqueness, stability, maybe move on and look at perturbing the parameters and thinking about bifurcations and so on. This is uh, the core of you know, 60% of the theses in my department at the master's level doing this sort of stuff with ODEs, actually. The inverse problem is the other way. We identify, we measure some um, aspect of the solution. Maybe we have a, you know, a time series of observations. And the <coughs> idea is from that perhaps noisy, incomplete, you know, shaky data, recover estimates of the physical parameters of the problem. Uh, this direction, the problem is ill-posed. There are maybe many equally good solutions, there may be no solutions, and so on, and there's always issues with stability, and the numerical methods that are used to solve these sorts of problems have to sort of take that into account. And so I think that's what's in the next paragraph, actually. The literature is filled with methods of studying the ill-posed problem and trying to work with um, stably minimizing things. And so at the bottom, you'll see the word regularization. Tikhonov regularization is the standard technique that's used in this domain. And I want to talk to you about something different. So the difference is thinking about fractal related stuff. Um, the collage theorem is a theorem that's a simple consequence of Banach's fixed point theorem that um, allow, that's the, the, the basis for fractal imaging. I have it on the next slide, oh, here it is. So I, I'm going to jump down here you because know, I see you're filming this whole side that I like to point. And there is, there, oh, there is a pointer. Pointer, oh, cool, okay. Um, so the, the mathematics we can jump to, and I don't see the red anywhere when I point. So given a complete metric space X, metric P, and a family of contraction maps, I'm already inserting the notion of a family for a reason, I'll explain. T sub lambda, lambda is a vector of parameters, and parameters takes big lambda. We have the following theorem. The distance on uh, the, the, the quantity on the left, the distance between x lambda and x, you can think of as the approximation error in approximating some given target x by the fixed point x lambda of the contraction map t lambda. So we're doing a fixed point approximation on the left hand side trying to um, make that as small as possible. That's the goal, make the approximation error as small as possible. These things could be solutions to a differential equation. In fractal imaging, one is the picture you're working with, the other is the, the fractal approximation of the image. Um, and the way that you control this error instead of directly minimizing it is to minimize the right-hand side. The right-hand side has this fraction with the contraction factor on the bottom that is less than one and the distance between x and t of x, which we call the collage distance in fractal imaging. As in fractal imaging, t is taking copies of the image or parts of the image and moving them around and it looks like 
a collage exercise when you're a kid in grade school and you glue all these pieces of paper on a big piece of paper to make an image. Um, as long as the C lambda is bounded away from one, the, you can control the left-hand side by minimizing just the distance on the right. So we typically ignore this one over one minus C lambda in the fractal imaging landscape. And that's explained here. So provided that, uh, so in this construction I had T lambda, there's a family of contraction maps, so and this T should have a lambda on it, Tx should be T lambda x. Um, provided amongst the whole family of contraction maps, the infimum of all the contraction factors is away from zero so that they all are bounded away from zero. We can, we can minimize the dx t lambda x for and find the lambda values that minimize this. And these are the parameter values that uh, would go into our model. And the fixed point would then lie close to the target. Um, so if we look at variational equations for a second to get to PDEs, I picked the um, uh, a one-dimensional problem just because it's easy to put the pictures up and the math is easier, but everything we're talking about extends to higher dimensions as well. Um, so this is the steady state heat equation. Uh, K of x is the diffusivity, um, and the right-hand side, f of x is a forcing term. You could think that there was a u sub t somewhere originally that was the evolution over time in a steady state because the forcing term and the k don't depend on t. We end up with a, an equilibrium state. Um, the boundary conditions were zero at both ends. If you multiply both sides by a test function in the space of compactly supported uh, continuously differential functions on zero one and integrate, when you integrate by parts on the left hand side, the boundary integral goes away because the V is zero at the boundary and you get this nice relationship which we can write um, as I've written it below where I've inserted the lambda on because now I'm going to think that the k has parameters in it for the inverse problem, and maybe the f has parameters in it for the inverse problem. So there's uh, parameters on both sides of this equation. If I measure the, uh, the temperature in this, in this object at steady state, and I have some data, I would like to recover values of the lambda so that this measurement is an approximate solution to the problem when I use those lambda values the inverse problem. Um, in the general setting, the problem gets cast in terms of a target. Pardon me. Lambda is, a, is a, a, a vector of parameters in the problem. So for example, if the diffusivity, if I know the, if I propose a functional form for it, the coefficients in the functional form, right? Um, in the general setting, uh, this all happens in a Hilbert space, so u is uh, an element of Hilbert space uh, find u such that um, a u b is f b is the direct problem, right? The almost anywhere piece is from the variational formulation, the, the a e, and this is uh, the representing the direct problem in terms of variational equations. The theorem that tells you you have existence and uniqueness is the lax milgram representation theorem, um, and there are some conditions in that theorem that manifest in the inverse problem as well. So in the earlier problem, uh, the setting was uh, uh, functions that vanish at uh, the boundary and are uh, yeah, whatever, h10, it's fine. Um, so the following theorem can be used to solve the inverse problem. So now we turn it around. We measure the target u. We have proposed functional forms for the functions in the problem that generate the vector of parameters that we're trying to find so that when we use the right values, the, what we're measuring is an approximate solution to that problem. And we'd like to find the solution u lambda so that in norm u lambda minus u is as small as we can make it. The theorem looks like this. So remember I wrote, Banach, I wrote uh, the collage theorem earlier. That was a simple consequence of Banach's theorem. Banach's theorem is the tool used to prove existence uniqueness, and the collage theorem that falls from it is the tool we use in the inverse problem. In this setting, Lax-Milgram theorem is the tool we use to prove existence uniqueness, and the theorem that falls from it, we call the generalized collage theorem. And it looks similar in uh, it's more words, but the concepts are similar. So we have a parameter space lambda, lambda, little lambda is a vector of parameters in there. We have a family of bilinear forms, it's a lambda. We have a family of linear functionals, f of lambda. 
And the, the, the hypotheses from Black's Milgram are uh, continuity or boundedness and uh, coercivity. So these two bullets at the bottom are the key hypotheses. A lambda should be less than or equal to some bound M lambda UV, and uh, A lambda with the same argument in UU should be greater than or equal to the M lambda. The M lambda will play the role that the contraction factor played in the previous theorem. You'll see that in a second. Um, the Lax Milgram theorem with that setup tells us that we have a solution U lambda for every one of the lambda values. And so we get this, this relationship. Once again, the true approximation error, this is the thing we measured, this is the solution generated by the choice of the lambda. This is the error in approximating u by u lambda. In norm, it's less than or equal to something. One over m lambda, and the m lambda, I, I didn't get excited about it, but they're bigger than zero. And as long as they're bounded away from zero, we can control the true error by minimizing just the f of lambda and not worry about the fact that there's this coefficient in front. The f of lambda before it was dx tx, the distance between x and t applied to x. This f lambda is a slightly more complicated looking animal. The supremum of this quantity, um, and this is, shouldn't be there, supremum of this quantity over the unit ball. So it's a little messier. Um, in order to ensure that the approximation is close, we just try to minimize f lambda. And here I've left the m lambda in, and now I've removed it. So if, as long as they're all away from zero for the family that we're considering, um, minimize this quantity. So that quantity I'll call the generalized collage distance typically, but in this talk I just wrote collage distance. That's going to be <coughs> that if we minimize, we know that as long as the m lambdas are bigger than zero, we know that our, our solution to the problem is close to the target that we measure. So, now moving, add, add in entropy. Entropy, the concept of entropy, um, as used in information theory, came from Shannon, I think as people in the room will know. Um, it's been used in all kinds of disciplines um, to sort of capture the amount of information that's involved in what's being looked at. Um, the concept of entropy um, describes a level of information associated with an event, exactly. Uh, there are some technical um, uh, properties that entropy should satisfy. It's continuous, so if you change the value of a probability a little bit of one of the events, the entropy should change a little bit. If all the outcomes are equally likely, the entropy should be maximal. If a certain outcome is going to happen for sure, and there's a whole bunch of outcomes that are in the list, but they have probability be zero, entropy should be zero. Um, and the amount of entropy should be the same, independently of how the process is regarded as being divided into parts. That's the complicated part. Um, Shannon's formulation is uh, you know, a nice thing, right? We have possible outcomes x1 to xn. The probability of each of them is p of xi, right? p of x1, p of x2, and so on. We sum all these probabilities up times the log of probabilities. Since the probabilities are at 0, 1, the logs are negative, a minus sign goes in front. This is a positive quantity, the entropy. Um, for our purposes, we are going to put the lambdas in. They're going to play the role of uh, the outcomes or the probabilities of the outcomes. And so we have to squeeze them inside 0, 1 because they have to look like probabilities. So what you do in any setting where you're trying to solve an inverse problem in the parameter estimation literature is you assume that they live inside some box and you do some search inside the box. So if the box has maximum side, maximum side length m, uh, I'll divide by m everywhere and then lambda i over m in absolute value is in 0, 1 and this plays the role of the probabilities. Sum from 1 to n, put a minus sign in front, this will play the role of my entropy. It's not linear, obviously, because of the log and product. Um, sparsity. Sparsity is a notion that's used in uh, problems to sort of uh, give the simplest explanation for things. Have as many coefficients or as many parameters as possible be as close to zero as possible. This uh, you know, is a simple representation of the solution of the problem. <coughs> and in this, in this uh, when you're talking about this concept, instead of simple, you often say sparse, right? Um, so some definitions if they're needed. We say that a vector x in Rn is sparse when most of its entries vanish. The vector is s-sparse 
if at most S entries are, are non-zero. Um, it's equivalent to using the L0 pseudo norm, the counting norm, and if it's zero, you count it. If it's not, you don't. And just how many non-zeros are there? This pseudo norm is a bad thing to use in, uh, in problems because it's not a nice function. So to overcome this, you often replace uh, the L0 norm or pseudo norm by the L1 norm. Uh, it, it's a good proxy or a surrogate, as I wrote here. And for heights, it's a convex surrogate. Um, it's also the best in the sense that um, the unit vectors with ones and zeros everywhere are, um, uh, this is the, uh, the one ball in this norm is the smallest entity containing those things. So it, that's a nice correlation. You can move further from L1 and use things that have some uh, you know, continuity properties by switching to functions with exponentials. And I just thought it was worth mentioning. I'm actually going to use L1 in the work that I use, as I'm going to show you. And so here comes the moment. Uh, I want to solve the inverse problem. We know from all our previous work with the regular collage distance and even with the generalized collage distance in various settings, uh, differential equations, integral equations, all kinds of different things. Um, generally, it, we get pretty good results. But there, you can prove, uh, in general, that the collage distance minimizing this produces something that is suboptimal. Um, it's close to the best, but it's not the best. And so the idea was, if we perturb like with regularization, you add a term to the real objective function and minimize this new quantity. Maybe if we add a few other things to our objective function, we can do better right out of the gate um, than we do if we just use the collage distance alone. So the idea is let's work with the collage distance, entropy, and sparsity together. Minimize or optimize simultaneously. So to be clear, the collage distance is the generalized collage distance. They're all functions of the parameters lambda and we want to minimize the collage distance. Minimizing this controls the error, because when we minimize, we're making the u and the u lambda, we're controlling that, right? The entropy, we want to maximize so that we have the maximum amount of information captured in what we're doing. Maximizing captures the maximum information, perfect. And sparsity, we want to minimize because of all the, it's a no pose problem, there's many candidate solutions, I'd like to get the simplest one. So here I wrote minimizing the complexity in terms of the number of elements in the basis that we're going to use um, to be utilized in approximating the target. So um, the three criteria are in general conflicting. So they, you know, they don't support each other. For example, if you reduce the sparsity, that negatively affects the collage distance because you have fewer elements in the basis and you're less able to represent the complicated function nicely in general. To observe that the entropy and the sparsity are conflicting, you can look at a simple example. Take two outcomes, probability p and one minus p for x1 and x2 as written here. If you start at p equals a half so that they're equally likely, then the entropy is at its maximum and Imagine now D of moving P towards one. As you move P towards one, minus P moves towards zero. And so X1 is now more likely to happen. Um, the entropy is decreasing because the half and a half was the maximum. And as you move and this guy goes towards zero, the sparsity is increasing because this guy's getting smaller. So as the entropy decreases, the sparsity increases. Since we want to frame the whole problem as a minimization problem, we flip the entropy to be, um, in the literature they write neg entropy, negative entropy, neg en entropy, um, so that instead of maximizing entropy, we're minimizing negative entropy. And then the minimization problem is minimize this triplet. And so now we have a multi criteria problem. And typically, when you work with these things, you turn them into a single criterion model in some way. I'll use the second way in the top, but the, uh, the first way, sorry, but um, I'll, I'll list three things that we've done over time. Um, scalarize is the first choice, so introduce coefficients and minimize the scalarized version of the problem for the choice of the weights that you picked. So the weights are not parameters, they're chosen. I'm going to be 80% collage distance, 10% of each of the others or whatever. Um, model two is introduce new constraints. So move, we have three criteria, make two of them constraints instead. 
So minimize our group, you can pick anyone, minimize the collage distance subject to inequalities on the other two so that you have a constraints and then you can use techniques from OR to, to solve. The third choice um, that we played with is goal programming where you um, establish targets or their goals for each of the criteria. So you, you pick values you'd like to get to and you then have these tolerances which I call delta one plus and delta one minus the over and under for each of them and you solve this the, the top one and you don't have any of the original letters in it but they're all worked into the, 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 the mess below. Um, so going back to the first thing, scalarizing. Here's a, a very simple toy problem, but I promise you that we have done things where it works in, in other settings as well. Um, to illustrate the implementation, uh, take a look. We have the steady state heat equation. I picked very simple uh, toy problem. So the true solution is x minus x squared. And if you pick, a, if you, if you, I don't know why I wrote dk here, it should just be k. One plus three x. And then if you turn the crank, you find out that f has to be this nice quantity. So you get really nice numbers, a really nice example. Um, we work with the basis for H10, and the basis is, uh, it looks better on the screen than it does here. There are the hat functions, each supported on little subintervals. Um, what I've done here so that I can play with sparsity is I have hats that are um, as big as the, the black wedge going up, so they're this far apart at the bottom. And then I have half the width, and then I have half the width again. So maybe it does come out that there's dark peaks, slightly lighter, and then even lighter, and they're all sort of in, uh, in the middle of each other. So if you do the simple calculation, I have 11 at the coarsest level, and then when you go finer, you get 23 because of the end point, right? There's, and then you get 47. So they share peaks. If you if you think if you look at the picture, and the sparsity should be able to play with that. So that collection of uh, it was uh, seventy something, right? 60, 70, 81. That collection of eighty one um, functions is the basis I'm going to work with. Each one of them also has half hats at the end. So there's two, four, six of those. So there's eighty seven uh, basis functions possible. In my representation of the target, I could have up to 87 coefficients now in representing the target. And similarly with k, which is the thing I'm trying to recover. Oh, and so, going back, for the sake of parameters, I take this thing, I measure it at nine points, I add noise. I don't have the picture of this, but we take this thing at each of the points, we add noise. Those 10 data points on the interior are my points. Using the 10 points, I want to recover the coefficients uh, that are in these spots. So I'd like to get a one and a three to come back. And here's what happens. This is the, the whole point of the talk of this, this screen. Remember the Adams, they're the weights. So one zero zero means I'm only using the general that generalized collage distance. Sure enough, with 87 basis functions, I can make the collage distance zero for that many decimals. The entropy. I don't use it anywhere, but I can calculate it. It's uh, 8.4, the negative entropy. And the sparsity is 87, meaning I use every basis function. The error, now not the error in the K, but the error in the solution that I recover. How close is it to the X minus X squared? The L2 error is 0.1. If I now introduce just a little bit of uh, entropy and sparsity, so I knock down the collage distance to 38%, 2% entropy, 60% sparsity, and when I put it together, my collage distance is now higher because I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm using fewer functions, so I don't do as well. My sparsity is 79, so I now don't need eight of the basis functions, but my overall error is better. So collage distance alone got me here, but by adding a little bit of the other two, I moved to a different parameter and parameter space that actually corresponds to a better solution. And minus entropy is, it has gone up because I'm capturing more information, right? I'm getting close at it. And if I, if I now, uh, this, this was sort of the sweet spot. If I, if I increase the collage to, because increasing the collage should, in theory, you know, not really, because it's an inequality, but 
you, know, you always have the mistake of thinking that that is what controls the error in the, um, in the approximation, but it's an inequality, so not necessarily. Um, so all I did here was drop the sparsity a little bit. I added the six more terms in the outcome, and I got even closer. And the point isn't necessarily the numbers, the point is just is that adding a little bit of sparsity, adding a little bit of entropy can be a good thing in terms of controlling how the, how the process plays out. So the collage method produces good but suboptimal results as demonstrated by the table um, in this case, and this, this is a, a thing you can show in general. A relatively low weighted entropy term can give a better approximation, yes. And the sparsity term decreases the complexity of solution uh, marginally here, but we've actually, I, I have other examples where it drops to a quarter of the, of the uh, basis functions and the result is strikingly better than what we had before. So it's, it's, it's a fun thing to play with and I can't quantify it better than, you know, showing that it works sometimes. So, anyway, and I have pictures of yeah. So that's the end. I don't know how I'm doing my time. I think we're... We have a couple of minutes for questions. A couple of minutes for questions, perfect. Anything? Yep, please. So it's, so it's like an arm. It's, it's a, yeah, exactly. At least, at least at this stage, because it's a, you know, a thing that we're playing with in relatively recent times, right? Um, will we be able to say more? I don't know, because it's a complicated animal, right? But the same thing is true for Tikhonov regularization. Tikhonov regularization, you take the, the real error and you add this regularization term for smoothing, right, for regularizing, and there's a, a, a regularization parameter in front. And so when I started working in this area, whatever, it's like 20 years ago, right, and starting to play with inverse problems, you'd ask the experts, how do you pick your regularization parameter? You pick something small. Right. And then you say, well, how do you know if it's, you pick, you know, it's 10 zeros on a one. Why did you have to go smaller? Well, you know, you just go small. And you, you really had to find the right people that would say, well, actually, there is this discrepancy principle that you can kind of use, but not really use all the time. What are they? And you get this sort of half-baked answer, right? So there, there's an art there too, in, in my defense, right? But yeah, no, there's an art. Is that not a pretty thing? No, no, I, but it's interesting that the same sort of uh, thing occurs in, in the, let's say, the, the uh, dominant approach to these sorts of problems. Yeah, Heinz, please. If you put the entropy zero, how do you do? If you, if I put the entropy to zero, then what do you mean? Uh, just ignore it. Yeah, just ignore it. The first line did, right? The first line ignored both. If you play with the other two. If you play with the other two, um, yeah. So I have tables of all the possible things, and yeah, and we see what you would expect. That the number of uh, coefficients goes down, and the collage error, if you find the sweet spot, it's an art, goes down. So yes, you do see this. So it's similar, or does it make a big difference? Um, you can ask who was the best, right? Right, so right. Like, do you get something massively worse if you put the entropy zero and you have roughly the same code? Um, it's, I, it's hard to quantify massively and so on, right? Yeah. Um, you don't, the, the last line here was the best line of all lines, that I can say. And, and I did a very, you know, it's easy to write a program and do a bazillion loops and then lift out the best, right? So the answer is you may, yeah, you may be onto something. Right? The other thing that's interesting, of course, is you, you think about the parameters in front, but you don't really have a sense of the magnitudes of, uh, I mean, sparsity, we know it's from 0 to 87 in this question, right? But the collage distance is going to be in the decimal places. So, you know, the coefficients, you have to take this into account, the relative sizes of the criteria. So you used the term suboptimal several times. Do you have a good definition of that? Well, we did, uh, so we, we, we published several papers in the general framework um, where if you think about the, the optimal guy being the guy that truly does minimize the error, then you can build inequalities and show the collage one is not as good, and, you know, plus or equal to, right? So you can prove it could be as good, but in general it's less. So uh, I don't have a, 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 a good definition of it.